Welcome to the linguistics course at Southern Utah University. This video will focus on describing language variation and change. In this video we want to talk about how all world languages are related to one another, but then also talk about how those languages change over time through location or social group or other factors. Here's a simplified map of the major uh, world language families. Um, and we can see it's, it's definitely very simplified, but it shows some groups of languages that seem related. And not surprisingly, the languages that seem to be related are geogra geographically close to one another. Um, one of the interesting things we can see is with the red, um, where languages that appear to have been once related to one another have been kind of separated um, through the spread of Indo-European languages and uh, um, other languages in Europe and Asia um, as different countries and groups formed. But let's look a little more closely at one of those groups, which was the Indo-European that was the gold on the previous map. Uh, this image was created for a comic book series uh, about um, Nordic peoples. Um, uh, so just keep that in mind. It, this is not created necessarily as a linguistic resource, but as a resource for people who are interested in this graphic novel series. And this uh, image focuses mostly on Indo-European languages. Um, and we can see that those two languages um, were once related, um, probably came from the same language that uh, linguists referred to as Proto-Indo-European. Um, and that over time it branched off into two major groups, the Indo-Iranian languages and then the European languages. And so the Indo-Iranian languages are languages that are part of the Arabian Peninsula as well as the uh, Indian subcontinent. Um, European languages we find throughout Europe, not surprisingly, we have the Slavic languages um, like Russian, Romance languages like Spanish, Italian, French, um, and then the Germanic languages, which includes uh, Nordic languages from Scandinavia, um, as well as Dutch, which is close to them perhaps one of the languages most closely related to English, and then as well um, German. Um, and the size of maybe the foliage on this image is just to represent the number of speakers um, at a certain point in this graphic novel history, which is kind of like our current day. There's lots of English speakers, lots of Spanish speakers and Hindi uh, speakers. Um, but what's interesting is that we can see there that English is a Germanic language, um, which is funny because we don't really think of English and German being mutually intelligible, um, but they do uh, have similar um, aspects related to their linguistic features. Um, some people think, well, English is so much like French, but um, in terms of structure, uh, English isn't really that much like French, but certainly lots of French words were borrowed into English uh, over time when uh, William the Conqueror came to England and um, lots of uh, French language words were borrowed into the language, um, especially at the aristocratic or government level. This brings up an interesting question of what is a language versus what is a dialect? So linguistically we would define it as if two languages are mutually intelligible, um, that the speakers could generally understand the idea of what each other are saying, then we would say that those are not distinct languages. They're just different dialects of the same language. Um, but there's another definition. <laughs> it's maybe more political or um, social, which says that if it is something spoken by people who are from distinct culture or speech communities, then we also treat those as different languages. Um, but if we think of them as being the same culture, then we would want to treat what they are speaking as being the same language, maybe just different dialects of that same language. So let's look at some examples here and talk about whether we think these are different languages or different dialects. So let's take a, an example of someone from small town in Ireland and someone from small town Utah trying to speak to one another. The truth is they may not be mutually intelligible, at least not without a lot of practice because of pronunciation issues and there'll be some vocabulary issues as well. 
So certainly, even though they're not mutually intelligible, at least not at first, we would never consider those as being different languages. They're just different dialects of English um, that could be mutually intelligible if lots of effort was put in. Um, what about Swedish versus Danish? Most Scandinavian speakers can understand one another even if they come from other countries. There's enough similarities between their languages that a Swedish person and a Danish person can talk to one another and ha carry on a conversation. Um, I know this because I <laughs> uh, used to live with a Swede and a Dane and they didn't speak each other's language but they could carry on conversations. But to say that Swedish and Danish are different dialects of the same Scandinavian language would probably be very offensive to people from those countries. They view their languages as distinct languages and not just dialects. So there's we're seeing that we have more of a political definition of what is a language versus a linguistic one. Here's one last example. Um, Mandarin Chinese speaker and a Cantonese speaker from Hong Kong. These are not mutually intelligible, but for some political or government reasons, sometimes these are considered to be all part of the same Chinese language, just different dialects but they're not mutually intelligible. They might use the same writing system, but a Chinese uh, Mandarin speaker and a Cantonese speaker probably could not carry on a conversation with one another unless they knew each other's language. But there's a case where, again, the political definition of language or dialect is um, canceling out maybe the linguistic definition. Uh, even though they're not mutually intelligible, there's political reasons why we might want to consider these two um, languages to just be different dialects of Chinese. So how do we decide what a dialect is? Um, ling linguists do this. <laughs> they study different forms of a language to try and figure out where um, one dialect is versus another. And they can use these kind of dialect maps um, and they draw lines which are called an isogloss. So an isogloss um, is a line drawn on a map to show where one dialect ends and another dialect begins. Um, and they use these to show differences in like vocabulary, maybe grammatical differences or differences in pronunciation. So on the left here we have a map of New York and on it they asked people in these different towns um, and they would get a percentage of how many people in the town said something um, to say this word that's written there, um, elementary. And did people say elementary or did they say elementary? Do they sort of reduce that one of those syllables? And um, people in the blue don't reduce it, people in the red do reduce it, and people in the yellow do both. Um, so by using this and getting other kinds of information, they can see that maybe there's this dialect that exists in um, upper state New York that is not appearing in Pennsylvania, um, it's not appearing in other parts of New England, and it's not even appearing in the southern part of New York State. Um, and so there, that gives them some evidence that maybe there's a slightly different dialect that appears in this region versus the surrounding area. On the right, a similar kind of thing is seen. We can see there's an isogloss that's been drawn, that dotted line. And what they did is they asked people um, in the, these uh, Midwest Great Lakes states, um, what do you put your groceries in? And if people said a paper bag, um, then they gave them the circle. And if they said a paper sack, then they gave them the cross. And they could see that, well, there's a pretty distinct, distinct line there where they choose either a big or a sack. Um, <laughs> there's probably some pronunciation uh, interesting things there as well. Um, so vocabulary can be another way to trace um, an isogloss. Um, if you're really interested in the idea of how do um, uh, language and dialect differences vary across the United States, you might want to check out this book by author Josh Katz. Um, he's a website you may have come across where he asked people from around the United States and some including other demographic information and then asked them about different kinds of vocabulary items and sometimes some pronunciation items and even a few grammar items. Um, so here's our example. He asked people, what do you drink from in a public space? Um, and 
whether they said a drinking fountain, a water fountain, or apparently a bubbler, as you can say, in some unusual um, areas of the United States, um, that uh, there were some differences there. We can see there's more of a Western um, kind of language versus more of a Southern and Eastern um, difference there in the language. Um, so that book is full of these kinds of maps, if that's something that really interests you. Let's talk about another aspect of language. Um, we've talked about um, how languages can differ from one another, but what about how languages are created? Um, and this gets into the idea of a pigeon versus a crail. So a pigeon is when we have a language community in which people speak different languages, but they need to communicate with one another. So they make kind of a form of communication where they borrow things from each other's languages um, just enough to get by with their communication. And that type of communication is called a pidgin language. It's not a real full language yet because it doesn't have a full grammar. Um, no one is a native speaker of pidgin, but it's just a form of communication that's used to help in inter-language uh, uh, communities. So for example, here's a picture of some farmers in Hawaii. Um, there was a time in Hawaii where there was many immigrants from other places in the world, Japan, China, Portugal, um, and they would all come and work on the fields together and they needed a, a way to communicate with one another. And so they developed what is considered Hawaiian pidgin. Now, when their children grew up, their children began speaking and incorporating the aspects of that pidgin language into a real language with grammar and those children were native speakers of that language. And then now we don't call it a pidgin anymore. If someone is a native speaker of that fully developed language, um, it's called a crayle. So really what's spoken in Hawaii today um, by some of the descendants of um, these uh, immigrants is really called linguistically Hawaiian crayle. But no one in Hawaii calls it Hawaiian crayle. They all call it pidgin. Um, but really, it's not pidgin anymore. Um, and it's different from standard Hawaiian English, which incorporates Hawaiian words and pronunciation into some things. But um, what's considered pidgin is actually a different form of the language, and it borrows some from Hawaiian and, and English and other languages, but it's its own distinct language, a, a different dialect that um, can be very difficult to understand unless uh, you are familiar with it. So I just wanted to bring up that difference between a pigeon and a crail. Um, changes can also um, happen based on our age, our gender, social class, eth ethnic group. Um, I have a friend who's doing a study on how um, different grammatical forms are chosen not just by what um, region of the country you live in, but uh, also based on your age and your gender and looking to see are there differences in the way that people from different generations use this particular grammatical structure. Um, and we find that um, it's not just a, a uh, difference based on where you live, but even in the same city or the same community, there's different dialects of a language and that the language is constantly changing. Um, different people use it in different ways. Um, we also, our language is changing because of technology and social values and the things that we care about. We're creating new words to describe the new things that we care about or the things that we use. Um, and English especially is um, very open to this kind of change. Um, unlike some languages like French or um, German that have sort of government sanctioned uh, bodies that control what is considered official French or German and you can get in trouble if you're a broadcaster or publisher and you don't use official forms of the language. Um, but English doesn't have this so anyone can change English and English as it spreads throughout the world is continuing to change and develop for people around the world. Um, and so in some ways this is great and it's amazing. In some ways it can be scary for people <laughs> who don't like that the language is changing and they don't want it to stay the same. But languages have done this since that Proto-Indo-European as people spread across the world and they uh, adjusted the language to fit their, their culture and their, their group. So we talked about how those languages were once originally all related, but over time they've changed and they've changed because of geographic location, because of all these other social factors as well. And this is normal and languages will continue to change like this.